So I'm going to depend on the intelligence of the audience to let me go through some of these slides very quickly and try to get through everything. So this is the ideal drug for overactive bladder, correct? I mean, nobody would agree or disagree with any of these. And no one would also disagree with the fact that we have no drug that satisfies all these criteria. This is just from the International Consultation on Incontinence. Let me explain it to you. Basically, all of the anti-muscarinics and beta-3 agonists have a 1A rating, mean that, means that their efficacy has been proven in double-blind randomized control studies. So that applies to all of them. This is just a picture of the new AUA SUFU overactive bladder guidelines, basically dividing the therapies into three different sections, non-invasive pharmacotherapy and what's called minimally invasive therapies. So these are the treatment goals. You are not going to cure any of these patients, okay? So let's just start with that. So at the outset, you have to establish, regardless of what kind of treatment you're giving, what a realistic goal is for the patients. In other words, what do they expect from the patients? Patient expectations must be realistic, and you have to establish these at the outlet or at the outset, but you're not going to cure any of them. Step therapy was mentioned. You know, that's out. That means starting with behavioral, then going to drugs, then going to PTNS, then going to neuromodulation or Botox, et cetera. Um, and this was really the first editorial that appeared on that by Lenny Ackerman. And it's true. So you can start with whatever you want. If you combine behavioral and drug therapy in men and in women, you will get a better result than if you use either one by itself, okay? Let's go with the antimuscarinics. Now, the antimuscarinics in low dose will affect overactive bladder symptomatology. In higher doses, they will affect bladder emptying. The antimuscarinics in low dose really act on afferent activity, not much in the way of muscle relaxation, but they act to inhibit stimuli that come from the bladder to the central nervous system. So it really depends on the doses that we use for overactive bladder. They act basically on the left side of the slide that you're looking at. And these are the usual results that you get. I prefer to use what I call a drug placebo ratio. I get the numbers from the material that's been submitted to the FDA for the various drugs, because I think that levels the playing field. And you can see that with urgency urinary incontinence reduction, urgency reduction, frequency reduction, there's a very high placebo effect, but these are pretty accurate. You can see that the urgency urinary incontinence reduction is actually greater than the urgency reduction for any of these drugs. These are the adverse events of antimuscarinics. If you use too high a dose, you'll get incomplete emptying. That may be a therapeutic goal, let's say, in spinal cord injury patients. Cardiac effects are rare in the clinical doses that we use, uh, but the other effects are fairly common. The question is, how bothersome are there? There were two consensus statements put out by uh, the AUGS and also by SUFU AUA on the possible cognitive dysfunction effects of anticholinergic medication use. That's AUGS, that's the SUFU white paper. Now these are talking about total anticholinergic load. So not talking about the patient who's not on any other medications, with an anticholinergic load, talking about putting these together. Uh, but they are a risk. I saw one of the case reports previously, somebody, young woman was on oxybutynin, extended release, a high dose every day. Well, these guidelines would say, hey, don't do that. It's okay for short-term use, but long-term use, you're liable to result in cognitive uh, dysfunction. So most articles su support this. They don't separate the drugs. They lump them all together. For instance, trospium, which is a quaternary amine, has never been tested by itself. Doesn't cause any cognitive dysfunction in short-term usage, long-term usage, no one really knows. So these are the recommendations for anti-muscarinics from the EAU guidelines. These are terrific guidelines, come out one, they revise once every year or two. 
Now, look at the bottom underline. No anticholinergic drug is clearly superior to another for cure or improvement of overactive bladder slash urgency urinary incontinence. Now, that's true, okay? So the advertisements that you read about selectivity, about this, about this, I mean, they may be all true in the lab, but in clinical practice, none is superior. So again, this is from the AUA SUFU guidelines. Same thing, look at the bottom. It is reasonable to assume that antimuscarinic medications are similarly affected without superiority among agents. So if you wanna compare, I think you look at the stuff that was submitted basically to the FDA. So let's look at the last two that were submitted, solifenacin and fesoteridine. The red circles are basically the effects on urgency and continence decreases, and look at the placebo. Okay, 5430, 5432, 5530, 6132, look at the drug placebo ratios, they're fairly similar. Anyone who does any studies on urgent, on incontinence period, whether it's stress or urge, who doesn't expect a placebo effect of 30 to 40% is dreaming, okay, dreaming. Now, if you look at the right-hand side of this graph, you see the difference between the dark brown and the tan drugs for overactive bladder. The actual drug effect is only the difference between those two, okay? It's the difference between the drug and the placebo. Antimuscarinics in the elderly, both EAU and AUA SUFU, fine. The outcomes are similar. Antimuscarinics in men, they will improve the overactive bladder symptomatology. It is okay to use them according to the EAU if the post-void residual is less than 150 mLs. And if you look at the bottom, use in men with moderate to severe LUTs who mainly have bladder storage symptoms, don't use if the post-void is over 150. And again, this is AUA SUFU, basically that says the same thing. It'll relieve overactive bladder symptomatology. And if you have someone you've done an outlet reduction on that has residual symptoms, fine. This is neurogenic. You can use them in patients, neurogenic as well. This guideline says, hey, you can use antimuscarinics or beta at three receptor agonists or a combination of the two, neurogenics. The beta-3 agonists, these are the EAU guidelines. Mirabegron and Vibegron are better than placebo and as effective as antimuscarinics in the management of OAB, but with lower dry mouth rates. Adverse event rates with the two are similar to placebo, so this is why perhaps they're a reasonable choice as first-line therapy, which is fine to do. If you have someone on an antimuscarinic like solifenacin, you can add a beta-3 agonist to that and you will get the same result as if you doubled the dose of the antimuscarinic but without additional side effects. These are the beta-3 agonist determinations from the AUA SUFU guidelines. Look at the second underline or second italics. The panel concluded that the efficacies of antimuscarinics and beta-3 agonists were similar. You can use beta-3 agonists in men just like you can use antimuscarinics. What's the problem with antimuscarinics? You can see that not many people, those are all the lower colored lines, stay on antimuscarinics uh, for even a year and you know by six months the persistence rate is very low. The one red line is the beta-3 agonist which in this case happens to be Mirabegron. You'll get the same curve with my Begron, but you can see that even so, you know, at a year and longer, I mean, the persistence rate is not great. These are the adverse events with Mirabegron. Now look at the red circle I drew around 11.3. That's why in the PI for Mirabegron, it says, you know, hypertension, blah, blah, blah. But look at the 50 milligrams. Okay, the 50 milligrams, no difference from placebo. How many people use 25 milligrams of Mirabegron anyway? I mean, how many people use 50? You know, I do. In Europe, they just use 50, that's all they have. So that's the reason that the hypertension is in the PI for Mirabegron is because of that one statistic, 11.3 versus 7.6 for placebo, only for 25. I think it's a statistical fluke. 
In the elderly, fine. Both, this says Mirabegron, but it's both Vibegron and Mirabegron, okay. And look at the EAU statement. Solifenacin, Darifenacin, Fesoteridine, and Trospium have not been shown to cause cognitive dysfunction in elderly people in short-term studies. Okay, long-term studies, unknown. Basically, this is what you get from Vibegron in terms of drug placebo ratios. If you look in what's in the parentheses, those are the actual results. You can see similar to antimuscarinics, urgency and continence, 59% reduction, 40% for placebo. Look at urgency, though. Okay, they don't do very well in urgency. I mean, none of the drugs do. 33% reduction versus 24.7 reduction for placebo. What's the drug effect? Okay, the drug effect is really, uh, you know, very small. So it's basically 24.7 subtracted from 33.3. This is Vibegron. Um, if you take people that you started on who do well and keep them on that, they'll do well at the end of a year. Uh, works well in older people. Basically, the side effects are pretty similar to placebo. The, the boxes are hypertension, no difference. There's only one drug, or there's only one dose. Comparisons between the two, uh, basically the left article says Vibregron is better. The right article says that there's no difference. These are the drug placebo ratios and the percent change in the PIs. Mirab or Vibregron only had one study, so if you just look at the UI, urinary incontinence reduction, you can see there's really not much difference between drug and placebo uh, for the two drugs. In other words, efficacy is really the same. Okay, let me just interpret this slide. Basically, this is from the AUA SUFU panel. It basically says, hey, the difference in efficacy between the two is negligible. This is from the AUA SUFU. Let me interpret it for you. It says, you know, yeah, you get a slight increase in hypertension, but with Mirabegron, it's so small as to be insignificant. Look at the last sentence. Overall, the side effects are similar. You can use alpha-1 antagonists for overactive bladder, and in men, they will not just reduce emptying symptoms. They'll reduce storage symptoms as well. Not so in women. I think you're all familiar with the fact that vaginal estrogens are useful, especially in the genitourinary syndrome of menopause. So the lessons learned, while there's a high placebo effect, there's probably a ceiling effect. And don't forget, the results you achieve in practice may not even be as good as the ones that I've shown you from the FDA submissions. Beta-3s have fewer side effects. and up to now, no cognitive issues, so thank you so much.